This is a Bloody Vegans production. Well, it all happened by accident, really. I mean, you know, a very happy accident. Um, me, like like many vegans, like we're so thankful for kind of coming into contact with it. Um, and so for me, um, I was, I think, 17 years old. Um, I grew up in Coventry, so I was there at college. And there was a protest at the local airfield. Um, and so this was around the time when there had been protests in, um, I think, Dover, um, against the, the live export of veal calves. And because those um, those protests, like they were so massive and they were so disruptive, so they moved the transport of the veal cars from there to Coventry Airfield. And so I went to this protest, and I didn't know, I didn't know, I knew a little bit about the veal cars from what had been on TV, what had been on the news. Um, I didn't know about the life of a dairy cow. You know, I thought like a lot of people that a dairy cow um, just produced milk naturally um and so I went to this um this protest and this little old lady who was like about that tall I'm only five foot three you know she's she was about four <laughs> foot um she's got like a little like tea cozy on her head like proper granny so first of all like completely um busting any ideas that I had about what a protester looked like you know because in oh, the media particularly at that time you know protesters were seen as very alternative, very aggressive, you know, tattoos, piercings, you know, people to be kind of like intimidated by. But this little old lady was like the antithesis of that. <laughs> and she gave me this flyer and I will always, to the end of my days, remember it. It was a pink flyer and there was a picture of a cow on it, a dairy cow with her udder engorged all the way down to the ground. Like it was so massive. It was all the way down to the ground. And in the flyer, it detailed her life and the life of her male calf and at that moment I decided to become vegan I I was at a really really interesting time in my life when I was just deciding what type of adult I wanted to be you know um it's a really interesting time I think when you start not accepting everything that is around you and you start questioning it um, and you start becoming your own person, really. So it came along at exactly the right time. Um, and yeah, as I said, I went I went vegan overnight. Um, didn't know how to cook at all. <laughs> <laughs> so basically lived on Linda McCartney uh, for a while there until until I taught myself how to cook. Wow. That, back in 95 as well, so... Yeah. So some time now. What what was the the kind of the landscape like from a from a vegan point of view? When when you went back and told friends and family, look, I've been to this protest. This this lovely old lady has has completely blown my mind, and and things have got to change. Mm. What, what was the reaction like? Were people kind of I, I imagine w weren't as used to hearing the word vegan, let alone having one in the family and so on. So what what was the reaction like? Well, I think for my family, I'd always been the alternative one anyway. Um, so I don't think they were massively surprised. Um, but, you know, they were quite happy for me to be vegan um, as long as I cooked for myself, really, uh, which was great, actually. I think that that's a really, really good thing for a 17-year-old to do, you know, to become, like, more um, independent in that way and to learn how to cook. Um, my friends, um, I, in fact, a lot of my friends at college went to the same protest as me. Right. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, a few of them were vegan. And if they weren't vegan, they were vegetarian anyway. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, I didn't get a huge amount of resistance from friends and family. Like, I know that people can do. You know, I think yeah. that that is, like, one of the hardest things about becoming vegan is the opinions of other people. Um, so I didn't really have, have that, which is great, but I did have to learn how to cook. Yeah. So... <laughs> Looking back, was that was that this that do you think was the 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 point at which you you 
thought, you know what, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a chef. Was it that early that that seed no. had been planted? No, no, not at all, not at all. I became a chef completely by accident. Comple- I just fell into it. So, you know, I, I, I'd never really considered it as a career because um, vegan food wasn't that popular then. Mm. There were hardly any vegan cafes or restaurants. Um, there may be vegetarian ones that had some vegan food there. And that was it. So the idea of being a chef was um, was not even remotely of consideration to me. Um, and so after art college, I ended up being a designer maker. So I would make fashion you know, things like, you know, um, accessories and clothes and stuff like that and sell them to boutiques. Um, and eventually I decided, well, this isn't really working out for me. I want to do something different. I went back to university to do art history as a master's. And that made me less employable <laughs> rather than more employable. Um, but, you know, I've always been interested in, in that type of thing. And then I was... Um, just wondering, you know, what I was going to do, where I was going to land. And I did a photography exhibition as part of the Brighton Photo Biennial. And my photography was exhibited in a cafe. And the guy from the cafe said, was talking to me about me being vegan. And he said, well, you know what? You know more about it than I do. Why don't you make food and I'll sell it in the cafe? And so I started there and I just started (sighs) making food at home and I absolutely fell in love with it. And it was... um, it was such an interesting time because uh, when I was doing that stuff, you know, I'd be just working from home, you know, just cooking, 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 like 10, 12 hours a day. And I absolutely loved it. You know, so by the end of the day, I would feel like I could do another 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but that, I mean, that was, um, what, 12 years ago, probably now. So at that time, there still weren't that many vegan restaurants around um, but I knew that I just had to work out how to become a vegan chef and so I did everything I could possibly think of I I did loads of photography which helps massively Um, I I went for a job as as a patisserie chef at a vegetarian restaurant and I basically kind of bullied the head chef into <laughs> into giving me a trial. So I took him along all my photography. I cook. I took along um, two cakes. I had been in magazines in, in food magazines, so I I brought all of that along, and I managed to get a trial. Um, and yeah, started there. Wow, so, wow. Yeah. The, thinking about you, you going to exhibit in this cafe, and the cafe owner saying, "Do you know what? You know more about this than me. Let, let's let's let you know. Let's see what you can do." Sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Did you have a degree of confidence in your ability to cook at that point? Because I can imagine if somebody said that to me and said, "Well, you're vegan, like you could," I, I would be petrified. You know, I might even think I'm quite, you know, maybe I'm a little handy at home, but you know, suddenly like putting my my food on 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 show, if you like, mm-hmm. is a different ball game. How how were you feeling at that point? Well, I'm sure that I was trepidatious about it. However, I think that um, when the hunger outweighs the fear, then you're okay. Yeah. You know, and my hunger for it, to do something as a career that I love doing on a day-to-day basis that was also for a cause that I really, really believed in, that was always the thing that I was looking for. And, you know, I loved being in fashion and I loved the creativity of it. But it wasn't um, it wasn't helping the world in the way that I thought it needed to be helped. Um, and so once I figured that out, kind of like nothing could stop me. Really, I became like very, very one minded, very single minded and very, very focused on that. Yeah, absolutely. How did the. The, you know, you, you, you've decided you're going to become a chef. You've got this opportunity, like you say, you're, you're working now alongside chefs and so on and so forth in this vegetarian uh, restaurant how did the the training quote unquote at the time differ compared to what you may have seen from the sort of more omnivorous the mainstream f- folk if you like um what do you mean like uh, like chef trading yeah yeah what was the path into it from a learning point of view yeah 
Yeah, well, I mean, for a long time now, it's been pretty much the same. You know, there are standard courses that include, you know, butchery and fish and all of this, you know, type of stuff. And a lot of people, no matter what type of cuisine they wanted to create, they would go and do those standard courses. But in the UK, we have a lot of chefs who have never done a course ever. Um, right, okay. You know, there's a lot of people who who haven't had any training at all go into working in in kitchens. Um, and you know, I think that when one of the things that I realised becoming um, a chef for the first time was that you don't to be a chef, you don't necessarily need to know all of the recipes ever. Yeah. You need to know how to make the recipes that that restaurant or cafe makes, and you need to be able to follow a recipe and be quick and do multiple things at the same time, um, you know, and that that's all really you need to be able to do. Um, so, but then I did, I really did want to become trained and I searched and searched and searched and there was nothing out there for me. Um, and I know some vegan chefs who have gone through the traditional route and they've put up with doing all the butchery and the fish and the stuff like that, but I knew that yeah. I couldn't do it. And I also knew that it would be a waste of, my time and money because why learn something that you're never going to use again um so I basically just had to have on the job training and teach myself really yeah, yeah. and did uh, did that did that early experience do you think that informed what you've gone on to do and create in in the in the vegan chef school Absolutely. Absolutely. You know the, the vegan chef school is basically something that I've created for myself 10 years ago like <laughs> right. that that me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that way, I'm making it for that person, you yeah. know. So everything that I do, I'm always constantly thinking, well, what was it I was missing? What did I need? You know, what would have helped me to get into a kitchen, um, to get onto the career ladder? And that's why with the chef course that we run, I don't just teach um, students recipes. I also teach them, like, how to be creative. But also I teach them how to be confident because you really do need a degree of confidence to be a chef. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, just the, the environment. Like I say, you mm -hmm. might find yourself thinking, you know, I'm quite I'm quite good in the kitchen and so on. It's a very different ball game to, uh, from my, my limited understanding, to being in like a commercial kitchen, you know. Yeah. Having read a couple of Anthony Bourdain books back <laughs> in the day, it, scared the life out of me I certainly wouldn't go anywhere near it personally <laughs> and more well, power uh, to you yeah I must say that his experience is quite extreme I think <laughs> um, and I think that there are more positive kittens around <laughs> these days maybe not a place to have started <laughs> turn me right off yeah <laughs> so when when did you get started with the vegan chef school Three years ago. Um, so we just celebrated our third anniversary. So I launched the school on World Vegan Day. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. 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 So three years. So, of course, you know, we started just with the chef course and that was in person. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, I converted the chef course to being an online course. Um, right. And then we also launched a course for home cooks. Um, which is the cooking diploma. And then the latest one that we released is the nutrition diploma. Um, so that is specifically for people who are working in food. Um, because as chefs, um, chefs and, you know, recipe developers and caterers, we often get asked quite a lot of questions about nutrition and to make a menu that is suitable for, you know, um, people with like certain conditions or that type of thing. So the nutrition course helps with that. Yeah, absolutely. So just thinking about three years, mm. you know, obviously a fantastic thing to have set up. One of the, uh, and it was two years ago, but one of the early podcasts I did was with a restaurateur locally to me who's a vegan restaurant, fantastic place. But one of the things that he said, it he was struck him as a, as a problem was getting people who were, you know, not only vegan, but, but trained. You know, yeah. and he said that this is going to be just become a growing, growing problem. That there's yeah. more people who want to open restaurants and no, no formal setting for them to get trained in. So, it, as that obviously that was the initial with the the chef school, so on. That was the the start. Mm -hmm. uh, how how has that been received by the sort of the vegan restaurateur community and so on? 
they are, as you say, crying out for people who are both passionate about it, but also knowledgeable um, and can hack it in a kitchen, basically. Um, you know, so so a lot of my students, you know, they, they put their, their CVs on on job sites and they get they get employers contacting them um, because they're actively looking for people people like this um so yeah there's a massive call um for for students uh, for graduates i should say um because quite often you know i remember you know like five years ago a lot of people who were working as vegan chefs yeah they were really passionate about it really passionate about it and that was amazing but they didn't know you know how to organize a kitchen like how to do a mise en place they weren't like organized in the way that chefs have to be organized and that type of thing so um yeah and that's only going to get even more so over the next the next few years absolutely i i want to get your view on something uh, because obviously there's that sector there's the the sort of the vegan restaurants and they're they're you know thankfully they're 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 growing at paces more and more and more of them popping up in different places and that's fantastic Mm -hmm. what's your view of the the uh, this sounds like a negative way of wording this but the the state of vegan food in in sort of the omnivorous restaurant world how how do you kind of view it? The sort of the options given at main in mainstream restaurants. I, I I say this slightly loaded, but and this might be from my perspective. I I, I feel like there's a bit of a, and it's it's kind of good in a way because it's it, they're good entry foods, but there is a bit of an identikit like uh, popping up that I found in in omnivorous restaurants. So it's like there's the vegan burger, mm-hmm. um, is sort of the is the modern equivalent of what the risotto from like you know 15 years ago maybe was the vegetarian option and now the option is like there's the burger and there's not a great deal beyond that it's kind of salad or burger Mm -hmm. what's your view of the kind of the way omnivorous restaurants and the chains and so on are tackling the the sort of growing demand in vegan food well i think it's great that there are options out there you know um that's phenomenal and you know having become vegan in the 90s that is like such a (laughs) massive change (laughs) and that that's really really wonderful but I think that they get a bit lazy with it um and you know there are places that um quite early on had a vegan menu like pizza express um but then they don't seem to have updated it um and it doesn't seem to be that progressive and that's the thing like with vegan food vegan food is very very quick changing like it's very it's developing very very quickly now um and they've got to keep up with the times so whilst once upon a time like that might have been like your go-to place because you've got all of this competition you know you've got to you've got to update it you've got to make it better i mean i think pizza express um here where i live have just launched um a vegan butter bowl and now i don't want to i don't want to eat a butter bowl <laughs> <Yeah. Pizza Express>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know and the thing is like you know if they're thinking about like what do vegans want it's basically we want the non-vegan menu made vegan yeah like that's it <laughs> it doesn't need to be any more difficult than that you know um so you know i think like what subway did um i think was it last year or the year before was absolutely phenomenal uh, on a billboard they had um their meatball sub with meat in it and underneath it was the meatball sub that's vegan and they're exactly the same yeah 100 you know, that that's all they need to do like you don't need a huge amount of imagination of course you need like the recipe developers to be able to do that um but that's totally possible that's totally possible so you know i think like the mainstream chains are they're doing it just about enough but i would like to see them mm. getting better now i went to um pereza in brighton um yeah. last week and what they do is absolutely phenomenal i mean that is like a whole other level um so you know pizza express need to go and check them out basically <laughs> yeah and expanding quite quite fast aren't they Pereza? so they've got mm. a couple now haven't they is it yeah. two or three restaurants yeah it is absolutely fantastic. I'd recommend, yeah. and you're so right. Uh, I, I, you articulated it obviously far better than me, but that the that's exactly it. There's a local restaurant to me. It's a big. It's a relatively big chain, but that, and that is exactly the option: Buddha Bowl or Moving Mountains Burger. 
They're both, and it's great. I'm glad I've got an option. Yeah. But uh, the the I, I do look at the omnivorous menu and think there's loads of different you know, variety here. You know, whatever mood I'm in, mm-hmm. I could go for something. Whereas I'm either in like yoga vegan or junk food vegan. <laughs> like, yeah. It appears that that's the two people that they think exist within the vegan community. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But I don't, know, I don't know if you get um, what I get when I go to a vegan restaurant like Pereza and they give me the menu and I just can't decide because I'm just not used to it. Like, yeah. there's just so much and it's, I just want everything, you know, but I'm just so used to getting a menu and I'm like, I can have maybe one thing, maybe two things at a push and one of them I'd have to ask them to remove the cheese from it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good problem to have. It is a good problem to have. It's like you say, I, I can only imagine the 90s in terms of, you know, the, the difference day and night compared to now. Like, they just, I imagine, what, what is refreshing, I suppose, is most places you go, you say the word vegan and people don't look at you blankly. Most people kind of know what you're saying, at least. Um, so, you know, the, at least that is refreshing. But, yeah, it would be nice to, to move on and adapt these things a little bit. Um, th- thinking about that, you know, from a point of view of somebody who is training up and coming chefs into into the world is the skill set obviously there's the, the the stuff that is transferable like you say running a restaurant an organization and not running a kitchen these kind of things but is the skill set quite different in terms of you know you're, you're not necessarily just taking the tried and tested you know here's the the the, the recipe handed down through generations of you know french cooking ultimately and so on that we're we're talking right actually you've got a come up with something really creative and new you mentioned you, you, you it made me think of it because i was as you were talking about mainstream restaurants i was thinking about wagamamas so i went there recently and they've got like a i think they've committed to like 50 percent of the menus vegan and they ask you at the door like would you like the vegan menu or would you like the the other the regular menu i still don't like the word regular it's not there's nothing regular about it oh, but, the normal but the normal the, the normal one. yeah, yeah. <laughs> When people say normal milk, I always make a point of saying, "No, I don't. I don't want the cow's milk. Thanks. I'll have the the oat milk." But yeah, that's just me being pedantic. But um, yeah, is is it a, is it quite a different skill set that you're teaching folks? Because they've gone, I've got to build something from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. So we do teach them how to be more creative. Um, partly because you know I don't want to create chefs that have to rely on recipes. Um, I that that's always going to um, hold them back, really. So they need to learn how to be creative. Um, so they have lots of different recipe development projects throughout the course, and I teach them the kind of building blocks of recipes so you know the five different tastes like how to introduce like different textures and you know all of that type of thing and yeah um quite often when people do go to work in uh vegan restaurants and cafes quite often they are asked more so than they would be in uh normal (laughs) normal cafes and restaurants non-vegan cafes and restaurants um you know to to do more recipe developing which they love like students absolutely love the creative side of things um but yeah i'd say it does happen more more so in the vegan scene and also i i teach students only gluten-free right and that's also something that they're asked to develop too yeah thinking of that that world gluten-free and tolerances so on and so forth do you, from your experience of working in or, or the the kind of omnivorous world, you know, in, in the past at, at various points, um, and then looking at looking from the outside in, perhaps for a bit more now, do, do you see that the kind of the food intolerances are making people also take things like veganism more seriously, or is there not necessarily a link between the two? Like, uh, I'm talking from a cross contamination point of view in the way that food is prepared and handled. Yeah, I mean, and people should be taking it more seriously. But I still hear from friends that they were given something with milk in or they were given something with cheese in and they didn't realise until they took a bite of it. And now restaurants should be taking that extremely seriously. Um, you know, of course, like, you know, if you're vegan for ethical reasons, like it is absolutely horrible to have that happen to you. Um, but if you are intolerant to it uh, or allergic to it, then you could end up very, very, very ill. Um, but I think that there's still a bit of laziness in some kitchens about that. Yeah, and and it also feels like it's just from a you know, thinking about it with a commercial head on. You know, if you own a restaurant these days, uh, 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 like, and you don't offer 
gluten free. You don't cater for allergies. Like I, I, I dread to think how many people, you know, ultimately turn away from your restaurant that you never know, you never knew but because of that. So, you know, more power to you for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are guidelines that all restaurants and cafes should be adhering to. Um, mm. So, you know, you need to be making sure that you clean down, you know, you clean boards, you know, when there are allergens present. Um, if you are cooking gluten free things, then um, you would, for example, you know, cook all of your gluten free cakes on, say, a Monday morning. So the kitchen would be completely clean, um, you know, flour just floats around in the air so you need to make sure that all the air is settled and that's why you would do it like first thing in the morning right with a clean kitchen um you know and, and things should be separate so they should be going along with those um guidelines and rules definitely because you know there have been some really serious cases mm. of um people uh, with allergies you know eating and drinking things that they that they shouldn't be um but i do think that if people think that um, you know, you can't eat something because you're vegan. They don't take it quite seriously. Well, actually, it's, you know, it's awful to eat, eat yeah. something, you know, that you shouldn't. Or and, and quite often, you know, like milk is like the thing, you know, like I, I can taste the milk just because a coffee cup has been near the steamer in a coffee yeah. shop, you know. Like that, that taste gets like so, so much um, stronger to you when you stop having milk. Yes, totally, totally. There's the steam ones in coffee shops always always make me, unnerve me a little bit. Mm. There's always like the, the, the cloth that wipes them off. Yeah. And then it's, it's you know, none of it looks like there's there's any cross-contamination being taken into account. It's just, it's, I guess, you know, these, these places are set up for the 90% or whatever, the, the, the mainstream... And they're like machines. They're, it's a it's a mechanism, and you know, especially like a coffee shop. Uh, yeah. So so it's all about you know pace and so on and so forth. And sometimes I think you know we've all been in jobs where we've been working on autopilot, and uh, I, I I'm certainly always like hawk on the on the barista from <laughs> where's where's the milk going and so yeah. on. I think you have to be to yeah. some extent. Right? Yeah. I mean, I just have black coffee. When I'm out, <laughs> oh, it's easier. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're so right there. Your your palate gets completely refined to this. I remember going mm-hmm. into a coffee shop a couple of months ago, and and they they used the wrong milk. I took one sip, and you get this. It's almost like cheese to you at that point. Like yeah. it's so potent, you know, compared to like. Whereas uh, if you'd have asked me, you know, back in my omnivorous days, to tell the difference, I'd have. Couldn't have, couldn't have told you the difference yeah. between anything really or just you know whatever so uh, yeah you're, you're so right your palate does get a bit more refined uh, as, as as time goes on yeah. um sort of moving into the 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 obviously the going back to the courses and so on because mm-hmm. you, you're the the chef course we've talked about a little bit but the home cooking course I'm kind of in, interested in did that come about as a result of demand were, were, fo- were folks kind of reaching out to you saying I love what you're doing. Can I can I have a go at this too? Yeah. So um, at the start of the pandemic, obviously, you know, everything went online with the chef course, and I started doing um, Facebook Live cookalongs every day. So I was doing them absolutely every day wow. <laughs> for months. Wow. Um, and you know, we built up like quite a following, and the majority of people were you know people who were home cooks, and they actually wanted a course from me. So I developed a course um, for them. So. There's seven different sections in the course, including one on tofu, which can baffle people sometimes. Yeah. Uh, one on vegan cheese, you know, one on cakes, uh, one pot meals, easy meals, like that type of thing. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I, th- I think it's much, much needed. You know, I, 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 when I came into the the sort of world of veganism, uh, you asked me about tofu. I mean, even now, to be honest <laughs> with you, I still, I still don't get it right half the time, and I, you know, I still don't feel like I get, you know, enough of the moisture out of it, and all kind. Of, I think we could all serve to do do a bit better. And actually, the the pandemic, if there was one, you know, one unintended positive of it, uh, it, it certainly, I think, turned a lot of people back to to home cooking, cooking from scratch. Yeah. Um, so, so to give them an outlet and some structure around that, 
I think is so important, and particularly folks transitioning into veganism. Did did you did you and do you have any folks who are uh, either not yet vegan mm-hmm. or uh, you know are think are thinking about it, or, or or is there a typical demographic? Does it tend to be with the home with the home cooking course? Does it tend to be folks who are kind of new to it, or do you get people from every every kind of uh, end of the spectrum? Well, the majority of people are vegan i would say like 90 percent are but that's 10 percent that aren't yeah so um and they're either people who want to you know kind of gently increase the amount of vegan food in their diet or people who you know have a partner who is vegan or intolerant of something um so yeah there's a real like mixed bag i mean i i try to make the the courses as inclusive as possible you know we've got the word vegan in the title because i want people to know like this is a vegan company you know um it, we're not plant based um and i think like, that's an important um kind of like philosophical stance to show people yeah. You know, um, but we are, you know, completely open to, to anyone coming to us, you know, for whatever reason. And I've had chef students as well who who aren't vegan. Um, so, yeah, it's open to everybody. And, you know, I just think, like, the more the merrier and the more accessible that we make it for people and the more welcoming that we are to people, um, you know, the more that we will be able to help them to cook more vegan and therefore, you know, reduce the, the the suffering of animals i'm impressed it's at 10 percent. i'll be honest i didn't i didn't <laughs> think it would be i didn't think it'd be that high i th- I, I, I think that's fantastic you know it just yeah. just shows that there is that like you say people who are wanting to maybe over cater for a partner it's just the the I- increasing of it and yeah. and interesting that there's you know potentially people coming into it who are want to be chefs and so on and so forth but not necessarily vegan Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting as well almost like they've they can see that there is this growing market why not add this this skill to my my bow you know what why not almost yeah 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 absolutely absolutely so um yeah and I, i think like people are a lot less scared of the word vegan than they used to be you know um and i think that that's why a lot of um companies definitely wanted to use the word plant-based um you know there, there were restaurants and cafes that i used to do recipe developing for and they didn't want to use the word vegan so i always called it the v word you know like it's like a yeah. naughty word but now people aren't bothered by that at all and i think that that's testament to um you know, organisations um, like like Veganuary showing people that they um, that it isn't like this massively scary thing, and they don't have to say yes. Like from tomorrow, I'm going to go 100% vegan for the rest of my life, and I'm you know I'll just kind of figure it out, which was yeah. essentially what I did. But um, <laughs> it's not for everybody. <laughs> um, you know that people can kind of like test the waters, and they can it, you know gently increase the amount of vegan food in their diets. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the nutritional course. Thinking mm. about that because that that seems to tie in with that sentiment to me. Like you you've come into it. Maybe you are thinking about doing it overnight, or maybe you are thinking actually I need to transition into this. I think for a lot of people, there's a a fear over the nutritional element. You know, yeah. I remember I remember a bit like you. It was an overnight thing for me. It was cowspiracy, and much later. Uh, 2017 um but i do remember that distinct feeling of i probably am gonna die <laughs> <laughs> which was completely silly of course but i remember thinking i probably will keel over at some point uh but you know ethically i didn't have a little one at the time but I was like, well, ethically who cares you know it's the right yeah. thing to do so on and so forth I- i'll live with that um so do, do you find a f- folks who are taking on the nutritional course in that space or, or is it often existing vegans who are wanting to kind of tune up? Well, um, the nutrition course was mainly created for what well, we call them food creators. So that could be recipe developers, chefs, um, you know, people who want to start their own brands, their own businesses, you know, that type of thing. 
but it's also there for home cooks as well. So the majority of people, you know, they want to work in vegan food. So they might want to be like private chefs, personal chefs. They want to learn how to create menus for people with specific ailments, you know, that type of thing. Or, you know, people in different age groups at different times of their life need, you know, different, slightly different diets. Um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of the students are within that bracket, um, but we do have some students who want to do it just for themselves. Um, and so with the course, the course is split into, into two main sections. So first of all is the nutrition side of things, which I developed with a nutritionist, a qualified nutritionist from plant-based health professionals. Um, and then the second half of the course is taking that nutrition knowledge and building menus, recipes, meal plans with that knowledge. Because, you know, I have researched uh, nutrition for a long time and it is very difficult to then make the leap from, okay, well, I know that vitamin E is in that food to, okay, well, how do I put it in my diet? You know, Um, because nutrition knowledge is very abstract, you know, so you need to be able to put it into practice. So it, it helps people go step by step, putting it into into recipes and eventually putting it into a full meal plan. Um, but, you know, the students who have done it just for themselves have been able to see that, you know, within their day to day diet, there are things that they're missing. There are things that they should increase, um, you know, and they've been able to think of like creative ways around that, basically. Like you say, is it is an incredibly kind of abstract and difficult thing to uh, to get your head around. Yeah. You know, like like you say, you you could end up with a list of fairly arbitrary whole foods that you just need to sort of just ingest at various points, as if you were taking in uh, you know vitamins, yeah. multivitamins. Like if I eat five walnuts here and this there, but but kind of it's, it it could become a fairly you know, not, I wouldn't say joyless, but but it, you wouldn't be necessarily getting the full benefits of, of eating great food. So yeah. teaching folks to, to pick those ingredients up and turn them into things and then do that consistently is, is, is you know, I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. And probably for many takes the fear out of it because... Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I would always say that if you make sure that you eat a rainbow, which I'm sure that, you know, you and your listeners have heard before, but, um, you know, if you keep to that, then you pretty much can't go wrong as long as you are a healthy adult. Um, So, you know, what, to me, eating a rainbow doesn't mean just eating all of the different colours, but eating, you know, nuts and seeds and grains and fruit and vegetables, you know, a broad spectrum of all of the foods that, that are available to us and mainly homemade. Yeah. Preferably. <laughs> Thinking about that, actually, because mm-hmm. that, that's a, a question I often end up talking to folks about, is um, the, and a concern I often have, which is why I ask for different people's perspective on it. But th- there is obviously this increase in prepared foods we live in a very quick grab and go culture admittedly there was a big old pause put on that for the last kind of 18 months or so mm-hmm. but generally speaking people haven't got time to do anything yeah. you know or at least they think they have yeah. it's a prioritization point in some cases i think but generally speaking we live these lives and so we we tend to be you know picking up things at the train station you know the, all this kind of stuff eating on the go yeah takeouts etc and obviously consumerist society that we live in big companies have found different ways to give us vegans the products we wanted the alternatives the grab and go sandwiches the you know so on and so forth and i have a little concern that that these things aren't necessarily they're almost just replacing mm-hmm. the same health problems that we would have had on an omnivorous diet uh, with, with the kind of same problems just in the different guys. And so we're missing out on some of the, or the benefits of, of, a, of veganism from the diet perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could actually lead to, so I know it's a bit of a thread here, it's a bit like mousetrap, <laughs> but uh, that, 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 that could lead to more people in the end saying, oh, do you know what, I had to, I had to quit. You know the the Miley Cyrus sauce. You know I had to quit because of you know my my 
brain health or whatever. These kind of, I was missing out on this, that, and the other. So, mm-hmm. do, do you do you share that concern, or am I have I got a tin foil hat on? And need to calm down a bit. No, I, I do understand <laughs> it, and I think that those products are great as a starting point and for ease. But I don't think it's a place where people should stay. So I don't think that you should just consume the ready-made products day in, day out. You know, they still contain, you know, fillers and salt and sugar. Um, And, you know, I I, I don't think that food has to be difficult to make. You know, I focus on a lot of one-pot dishes because I know that my competition out there is the ready-made stuff, you know. So some of my recipes have to be as almost as easy as the ready-made stuff. You know, it does. that. That's my competition. Um, but there are a lot of one-pot dishes where literally you just chop veg, put it into a pot, add some water, you know, let it bubble away, and then you've got a meal at the end of it. So, you know, there are things like that. But people have to consider, you know, what they want their quality of life to be. It's not just about longevity, but it's also about the quality of life. Um, you know, now and in, you know, 10 and 20 and 30 years time. Um, so they're not things that I think that we should be reliant on. Um, we should see them as treat food, you know, um, not not day in, day out food. Absolutely. Is, is there a couple of either dishes or certainly ingredients that you think any person who's either existing vegan wanting to kind of sharpen up their their diet perhaps get away from some of the the prepared foods the processed foods mm-hmm. or somebody new into the, the world for you should be absolutely con- kind of considering from a convenience point of view but also from a nutritional point of view is there is there a couple of ingredients or a couple of key meals that you you would consider a go-to to get under your belt well to be honest i think you know if you learn the rules of a one-pot dish then you can use so many different ingredients in them, you know, so you can chuck in veggies, you can chuck in, you know, rice or noodles or, you know, a a lot of different things. And you've got a one pot dish there, lentils as well. I mean, lentils are, you know, a lot of people like seeing them as like quite boring, quite um, like quite a worthy ingredient, you know, but it's a really, really cheap source of protein. And in our society, a lot of protein sources are very, very expensive. So, you know, even like tofu, you know, it it is more expensive than the vegetables. But lentils, lentils and spices are really, really good for you and really, really cheap as well. You know, and I think that that's something that we also have to really consider these days because food prices are going up, you know. So um, and, you know, people do have the idea incorrectly that eating vegan is more expensive, some people have that idea. I think we're slowly starting to dismantle um, ideas like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, those ingredients I think are, are great and great for sati- satiety as well, if I can say it. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's super easy to chuck in uh, into a pot, you know, lentils, spices, onion powder, garlic powder, and make, you know, a curry with chickpeas as well, you know, potatoes, carrots, like that type of thing, um, just in one pot. Absolutely. And and that, uh, a, a favourite of mine, a chick a chickpea curry mm-hmm. or a lentil curry mm-hmm. is an absolute go-to. And I, I don't think I've ever made two that are the same, to be honest, but uh, they all taste kind of good in their own way. Yeah. I think, like you say, you can kind of, uh, change your spice uh, profile slightly and mix up the ingredients and, and mess around with it a little bit. Uh, and you can't go too far wrong. I think one of the, the benefits uh, for me as a very amateur home cook, uh, that I found moving from uh, cooking omnivorous to, to cooking vegan, is you don't have to consider quite so much the the fact that if you don't quite cook something right that you're you know you're gonna die yeah <laughs> and it's one of the one of the huge benefits or you're gonna make yourself very sick yeah. so uh, yeah I, I, I definitely think you know experimentation like is something we should all we should all get involved in yeah definitely definitely i mean i one of my mantras is play with your food because quite often people can get really really worried that they're going to do something wrong um but, you know, if you aren't having the guys from MasterChef round for dinner, like, don't worry about it so much. You know, try to be, like, a bit more experimental, a bit more creative and, you know, take a recipe that you've done many times and switch it up, you know, and just try to 
be a bit more playful with it. You know, it is such a creative thing. Like food is such a creative thing. And I don't know how we got to this point of it being um so so stressful for so many people you know and and almost like like a chore that a lot of people really hate yet people love watching bake off yeah and there's just this really really weird relationship in in the UK that we've got with with cooking you know we don't want to do it ourselves but we just want to watch people do it <laughs> it is it is fascinating yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, been, I've been watching a, a, a bit of the Bake Off obviously with Freya in yeah. it I've, I've, I've felt uh, obliged to support um, but but yeah it is an odd phenomenon that we that we are obsessed with with cooking shows MasterChef and Hell's Kitchen over in the States and you know all these kind of things another, another vegan representing on Hell's Kitchen with uh, Josie over there so we're obsessed with it, but yeah, at the same time, don't. It's not like we watch it to go. Oh, that's giving me some some good ideas. I'm going to go into the kitchen. We yeah, it's just just entertainment. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, strange. yeah. And actually, I think um, shows like MasterChef um, can do a lot of damage because you know, I mean, I used to watch MasterChef a long time ago, and I remember seeing them say that a soup was too thick or too thin, and it's just. I don't know how they can say that. Like, it's such a subjective thing, you know, yeah. and it makes people feel like food needs to be exactly right. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think you might you might hit the nail on the head there. If I think about, like, growing up in the 80s, there was a lot of cooking shows were, like, very practical, very home yeah. cooking, you know, like, remember the tail end of like Fanny Craddock or something, you know, those kind of like, you know, it was like, this This is how you make X. Yeah. And it was, or Delia Smith, you know, it was like, yeah. it, it was, here I am making this thing that you should be making at home. It's instructional. Mm -hmm. There seems to be less of that and more of like the talent show kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and the kind of celebrity chef who, you know, to use Gordon Ramsay as an example, those kind of uh, showing you the kind of inside of the, the commercial kitchen, the sort of, you know, all this, the, the language and so on, and which I think all of that feeds into the psyche. It says like, this isn't for you to do. Yeah. This is, this is, this is for, for serious people. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I've never thought about it like that, but it's, it must be damaging somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot of time thinking about food. <laughs> so. Yeah. I bet. Well, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's obviously not a revelation to you, but you've absolutely, uh, Made me think differently about it. it. There's there's less of that on, on, on TV, mm. and um, and an interesting. Even though I, I've reflected a lot on the way that they've portrayed the the vegan angle. Whenever they do a, a vegan, I'm glad that they do on Bake Off that there is something, but there is always a little bit of a we can't really do it. <laughs> you know, like obviously yeah. it's not going to work as well. Yeah. There's always that. There's never kind of a like, well, no, you could totally do it. I'd love to see it where it was, there was more, you know, vegan chefs, like, like even like somebody like yourself being in in one of those environments to go, no, you can totally do it. Like this, say, do it. Like that kind of thing. Like, be amazing, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it's surprising to me the amount of resistance that there is to it because I think that that's where creativity lies, you know. It is so interesting to be able to take something that has historically been non-vegan, non-gluten-free and go, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Um, and there is often a way. I mean, we have create, managed to create like so many foods that have been historically um, non-vegan and non-vegan for a really long time. Yeah. And just over the last, you know, five, ten years, we've worked out how to do it. Well, you mentioned like uh, early in your journey, like patisserie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what, one of those areas that I just, if you'd have asked me pre-vegan and pre-coming across some uh, patissiers who who are vegan and have and have done it, I would have said, oh well, that's one area you're just gonna have to say no, you can't have that anymore. But I think there's so many great examples, you know, yourself included, of folks saying, no, you can totally do it. Yeah, and it and it's it's just as good, if not better, you know. Yeah. Um, which I think is a bit of a mantra of yours, actually. I've, yeah. I've stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to be honest, I really like people telling me that I can't do it. 
because it just yeah. makes me want to prove them wrong. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, like you say, it's not teaching people recipes, but teaching people how how to how to cook the building blocks, the fundamentals, mm. and then they can be creative and they can uh, meet these challenges of you can't do it and all those kind of things. I think it's yeah. it's an amazing thing that you're doing. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of activism in its in its own way. I really do think that. Um, it would be remiss of us not to tell folks where to go about finding you before we before I let you go. Um, and I really do appreciate your time. Where, where would folks go about finding uh, the vegan uh, uh, chef school and and perhaps enrolling on a course, maybe? So the main place is our website, which is theveganchefschool.com. Um, so we've got information about all of our courses on there, and you can book onto a course, and you can you can give one as a present as well for Christmas. Um, and we're on Instagram and Facebook also as the Vegan Chef School. Excellent, excellent. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll put links in the show notes, so uh, if folks want to go and check out uh, the Vegan Chef School enrolling in courses like you say what a brilliant christmas gift for, for some people just in time for veganuary yeah. if you've got a uh, a friend or loved one who's a keen keen cook um, and wants to take it to the next level um then why not um thank you chef radley it's been thank an you. absolute pleasure chatting with you, <laughs> you i too. really appreciate your time i know you're super super busy so thank you so much oh it's been a pleasure